Um, there's going to be some food at the back as well. We'd love to serve some of the food here, but um, please blame London Tech Week for not letting us bring the caterers in. But please try out their food, which is all over the uh, UK. I wanted to do a special shout out to the 12 panels on your right side. These are artists from UK and Singapore, and all the proceeds from this NFT art exhibition will go to charities. So if you want to help out some of the charities for disadvantaged artists from Singapore and the UK, please help them out. The response has been incredible. Just yesterday, we've already sold out half of the works over there. So please take a look and hang around as we speak with our panelists later. I wanted to share a couple of um, um, stats as well. I mean, EDB is a organization, uh, Singapore organization, that helps companies to find out more opportunities in Singapore and Southeast Asia. So reach out to us, and we'll be talking a bit more about the opportunities in Asia regarding whether um, for the food. Um, Diego, could, I, could you change the slide to the next one, please? I think it's the wrong panel. <laughs> Diego, can you hear me? Yep, just press down. Next slide, yeah, just press the next one down. On the other laptop, yeah, the screen, yeah. <laughs> They'll be a bit nicer if the title is right. <laughs> Thank you. This is supposed to make you feel hungrier, yeah? all right? <laughs> so I want to share some information for you for non-traditional um, proteins, right? Investment has reached record levels in recent years. 3.1 billion US dollars invested in 2020 across plant-based meat, eggs and dairy, cultivated meat and fermentation alternatives. According to the Food Industry Asia report, from 2000 to 2019, rising incomes in Asia led to protein consumption increasing 63%. All right, over 10 years, that's incredible. And the share of plant-based proteins in East Asia could increase to two-thirds in 2030, in less than a couple of years ago. And two-thirds of the people in East Asia, where Singapore or Southeast Asia come from, two-thirds of our consumption will come from plant-based protein. And the share of traditional meats, I don't scare anyone here who are meat lovers, but the traditional meats could be halved relative to both 2019-2020 levels in 2030. So we're looking at an incredible amount of change of Asia. And when people tell me, wow, I'm so excited by the growth opportunities in Asia for plant-based meats, I'm always very curious because people in Asia are very comfortable with plant-based protein, right? Tempeh, all, all these different kinds of proteins that we have. Tofu, these are foods that we're very comfortable with. But I think these leaders here are going to lead really lead the technological change in the coming, coming months or years. And I want to introduce Ferris, who is an investor in innovative F&B products, concepts and services, such as restaurants, uh, restaurant technology, plant-based foods, and healthier beverages. If you haven't met Ferris, you probably have tasted some of his wonderful food all across the world. He is an owner and board member of Gracious Hospitality Management and a portfolio of award-winning restaurants. I'll let Ferris share later a bit more on some of the, the projects that he's doing. He has so much energy. He's finishing his MBA at London Business School while working at First Minute Capital. So later on, let's get Ferry to share a bit more. Second person that we're introducing today is Martel, like, who is a global partner at Antler, a global early stage VC firm headquartered in Singapore. He leads a lot of global late stage investments for the group, especially in product driven companies in complex um, market conditions. They've also recently invested in next, gender fo uh, next generation foods and Tyndall. And last but not least, absolutely not least, we have Joe Hambly from Next Gen Foods. He's a senior manager in investor relations and business development at Next Gen Foods. I'm not going to share more because he's going to talk later, but he is actually uh, previously working with a couple of family offices based in Singapore, and he works across investment team and client facing functions. So let's maybe start off with some of the questions that are burning questions that I know our audiences hate today. Is food tech? What do you guys think about food tech? Is it you know, here to stay? Is it a fad? Is it a trend? You know, I see you looking very intently at me, Joel. Maybe I'll start off with yourself. Sure. Question over to you, Joel. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Joel. Uh, he mentioned family of us. So I invested in NextGen at the seed round, um, and I helped them with all the new market launches and lead investor relations. Um, is food tech a, a fad? We, we operate under the belief that in 100 years, um, we won't, we'll no longer use uh, animals for food products. Um, we believe the history books will write that uh, meat is a highly inefficient process um, and highly inefficient process and that uh, we will use far more uh, efficient processes such as plant-based meat in the future. Thank you. And, and I saw you are also looking where he was responding. What do you think about it, Martel? Um, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, we look at this on three things, basically. One is uh, there's going to uh, be 10 billion people on Earth in 2050. Um, affluence kind of drives consumption of meat-based products. Um, it's the taste. It's the texture. Um, 
So there's a problem. Um, there is limited resources, both water and, and land, agricultural land. Um, so what's the alternative? And the alternative is alternative meats, basically. Um, the second thing we look at is a market, market opportunity. I think the meat market is around a trillion dollars, chicken, 300, mil 300 billion. Um, so there's, <coughs> and then eggs and dairy and so on, right? So overall, there's an incredible opportunity to for a shift to alternative proteins, basically, right? So estimates is if we're reaching around 11 to 15% of market share for alternative proteins, it's going to be a $300 billion opportunity by 2035, right? Uh, so that's one. And then <clears throat> the third one, and we'll hopefully talk about this a little bit in the context of Tyndall as well, is parity and the importance of parity, right? So there's three components to it. Um, one is taste. So does it taste or equally, or is it is it a replacement, or does it taste very much similar to the animal products? Two is texture. Texture is really important for people that are used to eating um, meat or chicken and other things. And the third one is price. Can we get to a level where the price is competitive to where currently the meat market is today, right? Um, what our research shows is that um, alternative proteins uh, based on soybeans and others will reach parity levels by 2023. And I think Tyndall has already reached that in 2022, which is great. Um, alternative proteins based on kind of ye yeast and fungi and others will reach a parity level at 2025. Um, and then lab-grown meats, some exceptional cases have reached parity already now, but our assumption is most of them will reach parity by 2032. Right? So these factors combined, I think, is an incredible investment opportunity to actually invest in the space um, um, with just a 10 to 15% market share. So um, we're very excited about the space. We obviously uh, invested in Tyndall because we believe Tyndall is one of the most exciting companies for, um, solving these problems and working on um, you know, uh, driving the adoption of old proteins. And yeah, we should talk a little bit about parity and where you are at this, at this stage, I guess. Thank you. Faris, what do you think about this? Because there are not so many restaurant owners who are innovating at the level that you're doing, right? Um, what are your views on, on the question that I asked, you know, innovation in the food space? Why do companies actually need to innovate for food? Yeah, perfect. Um, just a, a bit of context, I'm bringing the restaurant perspective. So I'm a board member of Gracious Hospitality Management. Um, we have actually, as of Saturday, two uh, Michelin star restaurants in our portfolio. Um, and actually, some of them... Um, uh, the predominant thing that we're serving is meat. So what we're trying to figure out is how we can continue to innovate, how we can partner with companies like Tyndall and, and partners like Joel to figure out how we can kind of offset emissions, how we can source uh, our products more responsibly and know that, you know, even, uh, you know, a, a steak restaurant needs to figure out uh, how they can act uh, more responsibly. Um, I think in terms of the innovation that's out there, it's certainly necessary, obviously, uh, consumer mindsets are shifting, they become savvier, they're becoming more health conscious, more sustainab sustainably conscious, and environmentally conscious. Um, but I also think there is a sense of innovation for the, sense, for the sake of innovation going on. And I think consumers uh, are somewhat worried of that. So roughly 20,000 new food products are launched every year and 85% of those food products are gonna fail. And the reason why those food products are gonna fail is not because they don't taste good or the consumers don't like them, it's because the consumer's need is actually misunderstood. So I think the market is perhaps, uh, you know, projecting a bit too much and innovating for the sake of innov innovation without actually understanding what consumers are really looking for. Joel and the Tyndall team, by contrast, have done you know, a tremendous amount of R&D in their process. So I don't know, Joel, if you want to speak to that at all. Or, um, you know, I, I, but I think it's of critical importance that uh, you know, companies are really understanding what consumers are looking for before just launching new products in the space for the sake of, of launching them. Yeah, so we don't believe that one magic molecule will save the world. Um, what, what Faris mentioned is, at the very beginning, what made us different is we brought chefs into the R&D process. So we wanted to understand what is it that humans love about meat. No one wants to eat a cow, no one wants to eat a, a chicken, but what they love is the taste, texture, and nutrition. And so what we've done is two things. One, product advantage, so not creating another nugget or another mince product, creating something that's like a whole cut, um, something that can get chefs really excited. Um, and then going to chefs and saying, what is it that you love about chicken? What are the best parts of it? Um, and we started in Asia. Uh, it's the dark meat. It's the chicken thigh. Um, it's the, the fat, which creates the smell and the aroma. Um, and so we looked at how do we recreate this um, with 
uh, as, as little ingredients as possible. And so that's why we started with our, we launched in Singapore. Um, we wanted to launch with the best restaurants, the best chefs, people like Faris's restaurant, Michelin style restaurants started in eight. We're now in over 500 within a year of launching. What are some of the um, the products and dishes that you have uh, started with? Because I think you know in the UK you cannot imagine what are some of the dishes that we incorporate, uh, um, you know, to indulge. Like, could you share a bit more on some of the Asian centric dishes? Yeah, I mean, uh, so when you receive Tyndall, when a chef receives Tyndall, um, what he gets is um, it's like Play-Doh. So he'll receive a patty. You can shape, you can mold it, um, and innovation is being able to get the fibers to create that. So. Um, we have everything from chicken katsu, which is sort of Japanese style. Um, what we find is the flavors actually absorb better into, into Tyndall than it does chicken. So we have two Michelin star chefs who say, we're not putting you on your vegan menu. Um, we're actually, we're using you because your protein absorbs flavor and helps us create and, and do what we want to do more than normal chicken does. Um, so uh, we launched a Burj Khalifa, um, a really cool uh, dish where they have three different styles of Tyndall from crisp to um, uh, Tyndall with caviar on top. So it's, wow. yeah. I, I love that point about nobody wants to eat a cow or chicken, right? What they really want is the sensation and the reminders of certain experiences they had throughout their lives. You know, do, do, what do you think about this? Is this the part of in, what drives innovation? Yeah, happy to talk about it. I mean, when we look at uh, Tyndall and alternative uh, uh, proteins, basically, we don't look at it as a vegan, a vegan uh, you know, alternative. It's like vegan burgers have been around since the 60s, right? So uh, where you find Impossible and, and others in the supermarket is actually not on the vegan section, but it's actually in the meat section, right? And, and, um, and so... I think this key as well is when you think about restaurants and we had lunch the other day in a steak restaurant it's not that tindal shows up in the in the kind of vegan section but it's actually part of the menu i'm saying you know there's chicken there's meat and there's tindal uh, which is an alternative so curious to hear your thoughts on how you guys think about it in the restaurant yeah i i think one thing i'd add to that is that uh the plant-based consumer is the vast majority of them are not vegetarians, right? So this is not some niche market that, that you're going after if you'd, con if you'd consider vegetarians a, a niche market. I think, Martel, what you were alluding to further um, is, is highly relevant in terms of the products needing slight refinement, whether it's uh, in terms of taste, availability, becoming more clean label, um, you know, maybe even healthier for you. And I think it's just a matter of product refinement as opposed to uh, getting consumers conceptually aligned with the plant-based process, which has already, you know, certainly, certainly happened. Uh, and I would just say, I think seeding into restaurants uh, as a distribution strategy for Tyndall is, is quite a fun one. First of all, chefs are incredibly ego-driven people. So I think if you give them this kind of patty and uh, give them this sandbox to play around with, they'll inevitably find, uh, you know, the most creative and best solutions to it. Um, so I think from a product development perspective, and just kind of seeding it out there, it's certainly uh, certainly an interesting model. And and secondly, I think you know going into the restaurants first certainly creates and cements a sort of premium perception around the product. And as you move into perhaps retail or direct consumer uh, distribution channels later on, I think people are going to remember that first time that they had Tyndall in that amazing restaurant when, when we had it just the other day and four different kinds, and each kind was was more impressive than the next. Uh, I think Beyond actually took a similar approach. I remember I had my favorite Beyond my my first Beyond Burger in, in my favorite burger joint in New York City, where I'm from. So uh, I was kind of sold on it from, from the onset. So I think partnering with restaurants is certainly a, a viable and, and strong strategy uh, um, as you're entering kind of the plant-based or, or, or all-protein uh, market. May I ask you a follow-up question on that? I mean, restaurants are one of the channels for these new forms of alternative forms of protein, right? Are there other channels that companies in your space should also think about? You mean distribution channels? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, I, I didn't introduce myself, but uh, I, there's a strong Singapore tie here. Not only that, because Antler is based in headquarters in Singapore, but I built a company in, based in Singapore, an e-commerce space called Lazada, for and was in Asia for 10 years. So um, that e-commerce education, I mean, if you look at e-commerce in, in Southeast Asia, it's all about content and entertainment, right? It's, um, it's partly live streaming. It's partly gamification. It's very different than the Amazon experience, right? And I think we're going to see that in Europe as well. You see that with TikTok and TikTok shops uh, coming out. So it's all about education. Um, it's all about content. It's driven by influencers as well. So um, I think one of the clear direct-to-consumer channels is e-commerce, either working with the platforms and driving that kind of adoption through influencer-based social commerce, 
or um, by, by basically doing and having your own website. So I think you guys have probably thought about your distribution channel as well, apart from chefs and kind of thinking about kind of diet to consumer and, and e-commerce as well, right? Yeah, I mean, our, our first strategy wasn't to maximize revenue. It was about awareness. Um, what we're trying to do is challenge a, and create a paradigm shift where when everyone grows up, meat is, is, is what they look up to. Vegetables were sort of the dish that no one wanted to eat as a child um, and, and a substitute. And we don't want plant-based to become a substitute, so that's why it's on the meat part of a menu. Um, and also by launching in the best restaurants and the best places, brands like Oatly did it as well with the coolest baristas. You build a lot of awareness and brand, and it's not about us having a large marketing spend. It's about us partnering with the best people to create delicious product. So everyone should try their first product at, a, at an amazing restaurant, or they read about it or see it. Um, obviously, we're not going to change the world by just launching in restaurants. Um, and so as soon as that brand is built, awareness is out there. Um, we'll then go into different distribu distribution channels, uh, QSR. Um, uh, we'll end up in, in retail. We're not there yet. Um, but yeah. On to your point about retail, I think we're, we're looking at some um, um, potential you know, roadblocks, obstacles that might be faced by companies in this sector. What are some of the challenges you know, faced by companies in your portfolio, you know, companies, for, for example, what Tyndall is facing? What are some of the challenges and are there are some ideas, you know, for example, how we could overcome them? Do we need more partners? Do you need more investments? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I can start and we can talk about it. I think, um, I mean, we are talking about the three factors earlier, right? Uh, price, texture, um, and taste. And I think, um, I think we're there when it comes to taste and texture. Um, but I think a lot of the alt, alt protein uh, companies are still facing struggle of actually matching the prices of um, versus the meat alternatives, right? Because it's just, it's been, uh, it's mass manufacturing of, uh, you know, um, animal meat. So, it's very hard to compete um, on that level, but I think we're getting to a point where we can actually compete on price as well. And I think, I, you, you, I'm sure you looked at it as well, so that's, that's um, price is probably one of the barriers to break. Um, at the end of the day, if you think about um, food products as well, it's all about distribution. So cracking that distribution at the end of the day, you know, getting into the restaurants, working with the kind of flagship uh, restaurant chains as well, um, that will take some time. That's just a normal distribution strategy. You need people that have experience in the food uh, sector that, that have these relationships as well to get into the likes of McDonald's and KFC because that's really mass. And with mass, you get kind of, um, you know, uh, scalability and that drives down overall cost. Um, and, and then you can match prices. So it takes time, right? Um, but I think we're on a good track record and curious to hear where you guys are in terms of price. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we're already within 20% of the cost of production of, of chicken. Um, and this is at the very beginning of our journey. So economies of scale are huge. As we scale and b it becomes more mass market, more adopted, um, price will come down. I think the biggest challenge is consumer awareness. Um, in, in the short term, well, two things. One is consumer awareness. And the other is we want plant-based companies to stop competing against each other. Um, it's a trillion dollar industry, of which for chicken, 300, million, 300 billion dollar market. Um, for for plant-based meat, it's less than 1% of that. So everyone will always ask me, uh, investors or panels, and say, it's a very like crowded market. Try going down to 10 restaurants in London, New York, Chicago, and finding good plant-based products, you won't find them. And so what we need to do is create great products, and we need to work together to build awareness. Um, and our competition is the bird, it's not each other. I think the price of chicken has probably gone up 15 to 17 percent in the past month. So now you're within three to three to five percent of uh, <laughs> of the price now. Um, in terms of the challenges facing the restaurant industry, I mean, you guys could be here all day if we want to talk about that. But um, I think uh, supply chain security, uh, rising costs have been uh, quite a tricky thing. And I think uh, you know the plant-based. Market and I think innovations can actually help facilitate both of those and, and, and mitigate both of those kind of key risks. Uh, more broadly speaking, on the restaurant industry, I think um, with COVID, obviously there was some issues. I think one thing that maybe is uh, not as uh, loudly flagged as, as an issue is retention of talent. Um, I mean, service for restaurants, right, as well. And yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, you know service is the most critical part of any restaurant, and um, uh, retaining your best people is like in any in industry with the uh, great resignation, if you will, has been uh, mm -hmm. certainly a challenge that we've uh, you know combated. Also, respect to people in your industry. But a very specific question I wanted to ask you is: What are some of the challenges you face 
working with alternative protein companies so that those yep. companies out here would think about addressing these challenges when they work with the restaurant uh, operator owner, for example? Yeah, I think um, there, there, there's a couple aspects. W one would be uh, the substitute for meat, I think, is trickier than the substitute for chicken. Um, I, it's not often that, you know, I think people would say, I had the best chicken last night, right? But I think if you had an amazing steak the night before, um, you know, you would definitely write home with that, which is why I think actually a product like Tyndall, uh, the barrier to entry is, is much easier. Uh, you know, I think um, to have a chicken substitute that's so revolved around texture, um, whereas I think steak is a bit of a trickier barrier to cross in terms of the steak, the, the taste and, and, and the nuance to it. Um, but yeah, so I'd I would say really crossing the, the steak-related taste barrier um, is, is a key challenge. And another thing is really interrogating the claims that are being made around the sustainability practices of, of some companies as well. Um, so really understanding, uh, you know, what is a, a carbon-negative beef farmer actually saying, right? Because that, you know, theoretically exists in name in, in the U.S. And, and we're meeting with some of the most responsible and sustainable uh, farmers, but you really have to interrogate, you know, kind of what that means. And Ensure, ensure you know it really is uh, w what they're what they're claiming. Or Martel, do you agree with this? Does regulations have to play a role? Certification of some sort should they be public, private, or not? I don't believe in regulation. <coughs> That's another story. But I, I think it's it's at the end of the day the market needs to decide and the consumer needs to decide. I think one of the things that uh, Joel uh, talked about is. Uh, there's a huge meat lobby. There's no lobby for alternative proteins um, because that's still a bit of a, like uh, everybody for themselves and and c fighting for a market that is growing, but actually in, instead of working together. So I think there's huge. Um, w there needs to be huge progress on actually uh, uh, putting the heads together and building a bit of a lobby and actually pushing these. I think it's a huge issue. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, water, uh, you know, um, agriculture, land. I mean, this climate change is not making things better; they're making things worse. So, what are we waiting for? Um, so, yeah, I think we need to. I don't think we need regulations. I think, I think we need awareness, and I think it needs to come bottom up from a consumer. And if the alternative is not, you know, I, you know, I, I'd be vegan or veget vegetarian, but actually, I eat a Tyndall. Uh, burger because I love it and it tastes actually better than uh, a, a real chicken burger. Uh, that's the way to change the world, right? And I think that's that's what we need to work on. We did a blind taste study in when we launched in Singapore uh, at one of our restaurants, and 60% of people preferred Tyndall to normal chicken. Um, and so that shows that it's not about being a substitute or creating an inferior product. Um, already today, with food technology, we can create things that. Um, operate on the same level as taste texture, and this is just the beginning of our journey. There's huge investments, so um, we're backed by um, like a lot of investors in Singapore. So Tomasek, EDB, EDB, I've come out publicly said climate change is a big issue. Um, imagine what we can do with all this R and D and where we can take it. I think going back to uh, to Singapore and the, and the regulation questions that you had brought up first, uh, I think I'd say Singapore is definitely the pioneer, um, particularly in the in the cultured meat space, having commercialized uh, the first product there that's available to the public. Uh, Martel had alluded to it earlier, but I think in Europe uh, they're navigating the novel foods process right now, so there could be uh, upside and meaningful progress in the next 18 months. In Israel, you're seeing that as well. China as well. U.S. as well. I think U.S. is a bit more complex um, to get a across the line, but uh, you know, um, First Minutes invested in uh, some cultured uh, food products in, in, in the US. Uh, I think, I mean, the, the, the taste barrier for red meat um, would certainly be solved, I think, uh, with that space. Um, so it's certainly an interesting area to, to watch as uh, kind of regulatory uh, you know, barriers get navigated, and, and hopefully there's a sort of wake of the of the litigation pro uh, or of the legal kind of barriers as uh, setting precedent for the other to make it kind of uh, you know easier for for one jurisdiction to to commercialize products uh, in the cultured space uh, after the other. Um, I think we alluded to a lot of interest in Asia, right? But I think some of the questions from the public here would be, um, which are some of the markets around the world? segments in Asia that are showing a lot of promise and interest in food tech as well as the alternative proteins that we are, we are talking about. Please. Well, we, we don't look at who's showing interest in alt protein. We look at what are the largest markets for chicken. So if you, if you have US, Europe, 
uh, China and Brazil, that accounts for over 50%, uh, 60%. You then add um, uh, the rest of Asia and Middle East, and you have 80%. And so for us, where we've launched, um, we want to focus on those markets and become uh, leaders in, in them. So the bird, once again, is, is your enemy, right? Not the other alternative protein companies. <laughs> Things, keep that in mind if you are in the particular segment. Think about who really is your competitor. Maybe some of the food tech companies should really work together in some of a, a consortium of some sort. And I mean, we've heard Singapore uh, quite a few times, right? Why, why, why are you so involved in Singapore's ecosystem? Uh, besides the fact that you go investments, what, what is your journey like in, in Singapore and Asia? And of course, you can feed to you know. I mean, I'll, st I'll start. I mean, wh so when we founded NextGen, NextGen started, there was a decision, do we want to launch in uh, the US, in New York, or do you want to launch in uh, Singapore? They love chicken too, right? I'm sure. They love chicken. Um, w first of all, we had strategic and significant strategic support from uh, uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund and others, but also it's a, it's a foodie ha haven. So if you look at uh, the Singapore uh, culinary space you have from Hawker, uh, Michelin-style restaurants, global brands, um, and we were able to, to launch there and become world famous, um, partnering with people um, and able to showcase the versatility of our product from Michelin star Indian restaurants to um, local food to Western cuisine, and then we're able to uh, blitz scale and expand from there. I mean, for yourself, Martel, you're, you're headquartered in Singapore for Antler, right? Is there a reason why you've chosen Singapore? I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I mean, the math is very clear, 550 million people, um, an emerging middle class, uh, something similar to what we've seen in China over the last 20 years. Um, I've been in Southeast Asia for uh, nearly 10 years. So um, built, you know, when we were there in 2011, 2012, and talking about e-commerce uh, and, and tech and disruption, people were looking at us, it was mostly commodities and, and, and banking and other services. So we, we grew, uh, uh, you know, uh, a Lazada from kind of a coffee shop in Ho Chi Minh City to now what is a $40 billion company with 11,000 employees, a headquartered in Singapore, right? Um, and now Antler as well, headquartered in Singapore, building and investing in um, emerging um, tech ecosystems across the globe. So we have 22 offices across the globe. Uh, but Singapore is a, is a great hub, um, and a lot of support from the government, uh, a lot of support from kind of the sovereign um, around, um, and, and a huge um, innovative space as well, with lots of um, talent moving to Singapore or being, um, or, or thinking about kind of disruptive technologies around Singapore. So um, yeah, we've been around Asia and Singapore for the last 10 years, and we're here to stay. I just wanted to add that, you know, in Singapore, I think the reason why we're so supportive, beyond the fact that we love food, right, <laughs> is that we actually have a uh, 2030 um, plan, vision to have to produce 30% of our nutrition needs by uh, within the next 10 years. And that is really because of climate change, food security. We've seen what's happening around the world in terms of supply chains, shocks, in terms of uh, high energy costs. I think it's quite important for each country to think about their own autonomy, their own independence when it comes to food. Uh, security as well. And, and, and yourself, Ferris, um, how has, has the supply chain, has the situation around the world right now make you rethink about your relationship with uh, some of these partners? Yeah, I think uh, fortunately we were somewhat well prepared for it because we have uh, four different suppliers um, for you know, our, our main ingredients. So uh, we were able to uh, have some sense of security in terms of you know, what uh, went on, but also everything was locally sourced and we're in, in the US. So uh, in terms of reliance on some other supply chains, it hasn't been kind of uh, too impactful for us. Great for you. I think we've yeah. additional trusted suppliers like yeah. <laughs> that will really help you I, in your journey I, as well. I don't think any other business could mm -hmm. have that uh, sense of uh, security. So that was maybe one uh, benefit to having a restaurant during the pandemic. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of uh, interest here, based on the number of people here. I'd like to invite you, you know, just to raise your hand and you know, just shout out your question. Please. Yeah, I mean, the reason we don't talk about it is because we didn't develop, or we don't talk, I didn't talk about it in the panel, we, don't, we didn't develop one product and say this is going to uh, change the world. What we did is we looked at it from the other way and said, what is it about food that we love and how, how do we create taste, texture, and, and nutrition? Um, our journey started 25 years ago where we have a, a CTO who's been doing plant-based for many years, and so we use extrusion technology um, to, to basically 
take the, the soy, so it's created from soy, take the soybean, add heat and pressure, um, and then add flavor, and then really understanding what consumers love about it and create an innovation across all areas from being able to have the texture, the bite, the long fibers, being able to scale it up. Um, and being able to uh, create the flavor and the, the plant-based chicken fat. To so it's more like a trade secret. Yeah. Exactly, trade secret, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I could probably project. Uh, the first speaker, when we started off, I, I mean, we absolutely get the environmental impact uh, and the need around water, uh, sustainability, and possibly ethical reasons to innovate in this uh, category. We didn't speak about nutrition. And so in the West, particularly the US, UK, uh, the Beyond Burgers, Beyond Meats, they've seen a slight decline in sales. And there's been a, a, a some consumer resistance because of perhaps a, a perception that it might, this, that the lab-grown uh, offerings and chemical food substitutes aren't necessarily as nutritious. How are you circumventing or working around that in, in your in your space, but your chicken might not have the same issues, but how are you thinking about that in terms of food security, ultimately? <coughs> I think you should talk about it. I'll talk about it a very little bit. Um, I think, yeah, if you look at uh, some of the earlier adopters of, of alternative proteins, it's, um, I think what we saw was high levels of sodium. Um, we saw, and, and, and you said some, some nutrition there. So I think the innovation goes further, right? I think. Um, uh, th that was where, where we had it. we saw a bit of customer pushback as well. But I think if you look at the products that are coming to markets now, they actually tackle these before they go to market. So we see significant lower uh, levels of sodium, high nutrition. Um, I think you can talk a little bit about, I yeah. guess, Tyndall and how. Yeah. The, what are the levels compared to some incumbents in the market? Yeah, it, it is low. So, but um, in answer to your question as well, the perception. Um, is a huge one. So there are plant-based companies which have like 30 ingredients, they have something novel, um, and there's a lot of PR and press talking about what's inside it. Um, the other question is it, how processed is it? Um, and so when we started, we decided we wanted to be super clean, have a very short ingredient list, only nine, be very um, open with, with what's inside. Um, and we also, if you, when you talk about chicken, one of the things you don't often think about is the things that are there which you don't know about, right? So uh, the rise of uh, antibiotics which are used in the supply chain. Um, uh, all we do is we take chicken out of it. So if you think about how um, the food and how efficient it is, you take soy, um, that's then turned into animal feed which is then fed to chickens which are then slaughtered. There are parts of the chicken that we don't use to feed us, from beaks to feathers. Um, many die along the way, and then you have your end product. What we're doing is we're taking soy, adding heat pressure and natural flavoring, uh, so alliums, to then create that product and removing it from the system. So, um, yeah. so I mean, ultimately, the key question here is, in the long run, <coughs> do we create a nutrition deficit in our population? if we're not addressing these issues intentionally uh, by switching them to a plant base off the sort of B12 that meat, c meat contains? And that's, that's the key question that I think many are asking. Yeah, and I, I think that's also uh, uh, something which we can do as the next step of innovation with plant-based, right? So can you then add in things and make it more nutritious than meat? Um, what we've tried to do now is we've tried to replicate the key areas from like protein levels. We try to reduce the nasty things in terms of cholesterol. Um, but with innovation, we're at, the, we're at the start of the journey. I think that's the, the next step. Any other questions from just to raise your hand? Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, I think y you mentioned um, uh, some companies which are, uh, are struggling at the moment, um, and that obviously has an effect on the whole industry. Um, but I think that if we can focus on creating great products, um, then we can play a huge role in increasing the market. Um, I think the number one thing which is affecting the whole industry um, is if there are so people always say to me, oh, I tried this chicken product and uh, it was amazing, are you worried? Um, no, we're not, because if they try a bad product, 
um, they're not going to try another one. Um, and so for us, it's about how do we then make sure that our, everyone has great plant-based products? How do we all grow together? Um, and I think that will then um, mean that other companies will start to succeed, which will then bring investor interest uh, and to continued levels. Mm -hmm. I really think you should start some sort of a consortium. <laughs> <laughs> as as what Martel mentioned, right? To lobby and to get everyone to do better together, right? Because you just need a couple of bad eggs to spoil everybody's impression of this uh, growing industry, right? It's the same thing for most emerging sectors. Anything to add to that as well, Martel, I know, Paris? Well, I think uh, one thing I would add to it is, um, well, you have two Tyndall investors uh, up here as well. So in, in, in response to, to your question, I think what uh, what I looked at and what, what really stood apart for me was, um, you know, the path to commercialization that Tyndall had in comparison to the legacy players and the missteps that they've avoided. I think, you know, there are definitely some headwinds overall, and I think uh, some of the valuations of, uh, you know, the, the public companies and the plant-based space that have come down to earth uh, a bit, um, you know, th there, there might be a bit of a, you know, shock to the, to the industry, but I think when you look at the individual players and companies like Tyndall and seeing what they've done to avoid the missteps of, of the predecessors uh, definitely uh, made me quite bullish on the, on the company. Um, but again, I mean, it's, it's what I mentioned earlier. You, you, have, you have to pick the right players. You have to pick, pick the winners. I think there's definitely an oversaturation of, of, of innovation. Uh, so I think it's really about uh, understanding the team, understanding the product, the defensibility, as was asked earlier. Um, and really, like with any investment, uh, you know, picking picking the, the the right the right product. At the end of the day, it's a it's a the, it's a growing market. It's the pie is actually getting bigger, right? And I, I, as an investor, what you look at is the fundamentals of the business as well: healthy unit economics, healthy growth as well. Um, so I, I don't, you know, the current kind of uh, headlines that you see on Impossible and Beyond and so on. I think that's just. It's not gonna. It's gonna go away, and I think there's a massive opportunity. I think we're at like three percent market share totally, and I spoke about this earlier. The market opportunity and the customer awareness that is growing every day. So, for us, it's uh, we're actually you know, especially companies that are early stage that are working on innovative new solutions. We're very bullish on, and we continue to invest in them. Right. Wait, in, in the UK, Sorry, just one more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you have a question as well? Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some creative solutions to it. Um, I th a company that I think all three of us absolutely love and admire is Notco, um, very innovative in the space, and um, they just call things not milk and not meat and, and not mayo. And um, I think it really it's more of a branding exercise. I think the product will speak for itself as opposed to kind of the brand perception of it. Um, but definitely will take a little bit of creativity. Um, I think as as long as people are able to try it for the first time, um, you know, uh, same thing could be said of I can't believe it's not butter, right? Uh, so yeah, I think it's a bit of a, a branding exercise. But as long as the product is, is good enough, people will will certainly adopt it. But it's also why we call ourselves Tyndall. So if you look at the evolution of names, you, you have at the beginning, you had like a veggie delights, things which were focused on vegan vegetarians. Then you had um, Beyond Burger, Impossible Meat, uh, Like Meat. Um, and then we wanted to say, we want to create a new category which goes a step beyond that. It's not a substitute anymore. Um, and that's why we call ourselves Tyndall. Um, because we believe that's the next step um, beyond that. We have time for one last question before we wrap up the panel. Okay, please. Yeah, I mean, well, we use significantly less soy um, in producing Tyndall than you would by turning it into animal, fe animal feed and how much is needed to rear a chicken. So it's a, it's a question that gets asked a lot, and it, there, we do have to think about supply. Um, but by using plant-based options in Tyndall, you would end up using less um, than you would through traditional. 
you lose a lot during the conversion process, step by step, yeah. right? Yeah, great point. Um, I'd want to invite our panelists just to wrap it up. Um, one takeaway for the audience in 30 seconds, um, whoever wants to start first, please do, or a call out to say, I'm really, I'm keen to collaborate with partners like this. No, I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, it comes down to t tasting it, right? Um, so I invite you to, to, to taste uh, these alternative meat products. Um, obviously, you know, please try Tyndall as well. Um, it makes a huge difference uh, of, of your, your acceptance of, of, of and it's a massive industry. I think it's definitely something to watch out for as an investor, as an entrepreneur to get into. Um, at the end of the day, it comes down to, again, three, three things. Um, and, um, you know, if you taste it, you will see that they check more, at least two of the three boxes and we're working very hard on the third one, which is price. Um, so go out and try, uh, try Tyndall. Uh, <laughs> so we, we launched, uh, we only just launched in the UK with uh, over 50 outlets, so um, we launched in similar to our approach of iconic places, uh, Sketch was one of our launch partners, um, we launched in Brewdog, um, we've launched on our website, you have, if you go on tindall.com you can see all our restaurants which are there and it will show you the nearest one near you. Yeah, lunch is just around the corner. <laughs> Maybe Ferris, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, I mean, in conclusion, underpinning, you know, all climate tech innovation, all, all food innovation is not only is it the right thing to do, not only the ethical thing to do, environmentally, uh, you know, conscious thing to do, but it is actually, you know, the only option. Uh, I think consumers are going to demand it, countries are going to demand it, and ultimately, um, you know, it is the time now. And I think, you know, those that invest in the space not only be doing the right thing, but will make a ton of money in the process. So it's um, really not, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of the win-win. Um, and in terms of um, partners, I, partners looking for in the crowd, if anyone is a, a food tech founder, um, please feel free to, to contact me, uh, lead food techs at uh, First Minute. So happy to chat with uh, anyone that, that wants to, to chat further. Yeah, I mean, where we are now is um, we're not in fundraising mode, we're, we're, we're in the, the business now of trying to grow as quickly as we can. We have no regulatory restrictions. We want to uh, we want to bring Tyndall to the world. So um, if there's anyone who uh, is in the restaurant industry or who wants to collaborate, we'd be more than happy to, to talk to you guys. Thank you very much. Round of applause for our panelists, please.